You got to keep pushing. You can't let nobody uh, crush your spirit. It's easier said than done. You can't let nobody crush your spirit. Um, and you deserve to be here. There's, then there's some explicit things we can say, like, man, you know, F them peoples. <laughs> we ain't worried about them. <laughs> this our life. We not letting them dictate what we got going on. But again, easier said than done, because, you know, people, they want to be loved by who they want to be loved by. Yep. And unfortunately, things don't always work out that way for us. And sometimes it is for the better, man. You know, when you when you in it. Now it's different when it's your parents, but when it's like an, um, a romantic relationship, you might think you want this person, but you let some time go by and it will be revealed to you why you guys could could never work. Dip it in there first. Get that solution in there. Yeah. Big dip. <sighs> there we go. <laughs> go ahead. Don't be afraid to splash. Do what you got to do. Get your towel if you ever need to wipe anything off. All right. Cool. My baby's got beat up at work, man. So millions of people stepping on my toes every night. I remember how they was before. Uh, <laughs> I'll be looking at them jokes before I kind of watch it. <laughs> I used to keep you gorgeous. Now look at me. My babies, man. I'm not the owner I used to be. All right, man. Let's talk about the tech layoff. Okay. This is a good place right now. Good place to start. <laughs> what was what was the tech layoff like for you? Uh, I'm gonna say devastating. Um, it was weird because it came out of nowhere. Um, it's not the first time I've been laid off. Uh, and I was kind of warned by another one of my coworkers about a particular manager of mine and how he likes to throw people under the bus. Mm -hmm. um, we had a project that we was working on and uh, I didn't really have everything I needed like access to certain uh, systems um, contact lists for the proper uh, personal contact that I needed to um, to be in communication with in order to do my job properly so it made everything hard which is, in my opinion, it would have been something that this person would have needed to provide, which was the manager. Like, for instance, um, so my job was I was a senior monitor engineer, and we I needed to install these agents on specific servers to monitor the uh, applications um, in particular environments. The issue with that is um, in order to gain access to this environment, you need to have people's proper uh, contacts, right? So when they gave me the list of who to contact for these certain systems, I would, I would, <laughs> I would uh, call these people, set up a meeting with them, and they'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'd be like, well, I have this list that states that you are the person to contact for the, you know, this specific environment. And so... Send me on a wild goose chase, like you know. I have to like um, talk to about two or three people within this department to find the right person that I need to talk to in order to get the job done that I needed to get done. Now, when you in uh, when you work for a specific company, this is a pretty big company in DC. Um, you on the timeline, you on the time frame. So when you had those meetings, they want those updates. Uh, hey, what do we got done? 
And a lot of times they ain't trying to hear, oh, we ran into a snag, right? Even if you, you run into a snag, which is something you technically can't control when you have to work with other people. Um, some of those systems, you got you to gotta get in contact with the people and then you have to do a background check before they even allow you to touch their systems, right? So I had alerted him to what was going on, uh, the issues I was running into, and then shortly after that, they had let me go um, out of the blue. Now, they didn't give the recruiter, you know, any uh, information on why they let me go, but I assume it has something to do with things probably wasn't moving as fast as he wanted it to. And then I saw that role was, uh, it was available on a on job board, uh, but it was changed this time. It was $10 cheaper, the pay was uh, $10 less, and it was on site, whereas it was remote before. Now the person who was before me, I guess she got out before he could, you know, <laughs> do that to her. But like I said, my coworker warned me about him, was like, man, this dude like to throw people under the bus. Um, so I say sometimes, man, you got people in positions of power and they're not like really good uh, teammates, if you will. They kind of power hungry and, and, and a lot of them are lazy because this particular person, although he has the position, he got the position um, because there was a lot of uh, shake up in the company where a lot of people left. So there was a lot of uh, turnover. So he just kind of, the position defaulted to him. So he wasn't really even qualified for the position that he was in. Um, so yeah, um, I was familiar with that experience with, uh, some other roles that I've been in before, but yeah, uh, when you work in day and night, solving problems, getting things done, and, uh, you working with, uh, a higher up who's doesn't communicate well, um, they don't document things well and everything falls on you. It can be irritating. <laughs> it can definitely be irritating. Yeah, but I said I was blindsided by it. But I, I definitely had an inclination. Because uh, some of those meetings we were in, uh, my partner would be arguing with that particular manager about certain things that we needed in the environment. Um, he wanted to upgrade some of the servers and wanted a specific type of server, and they would argue about whether they wanted a Microsoft server or a Linux server, the pros and cons of it. And I would typically was agreeing with my partner on that, right? Because that was really his expertise. It wasn't the expertise of our manager. Um, but I guess his thing is uh, probably going to be the monitor of the finances. I'm not really sure what he does because um, I didn't work in close tandem with him. Anything I needed, it was usually my partner. He didn't have no information for me, for real. So, yeah, um, it was a learning experience. Learned a lot, learned, uh, learned how to problem solve. Um, one of the projects I was working on ran into a snag while trying to upgrade um, one of our monitoring systems. And I had to reach out to support. And the issue was so bad, man. Support was like, man, I've never seen nothing like this before. Because the person who was there before me, she had been gone for about two years. Because this was like in the middle of the pandemic. So she had been gone for two years. So when I got there, um, some of the base things, the basic things that a server would typically have, it didn't have. It didn't have Java. Uh, <laughs> it didn't have Java installed. Um, I had a, man, I think I had to install like 50 something hot fixes. This was like two years. Imagine you got a computer and you just got to do two years of updates before you can do the, just the main update to get it to the modern version. What's a hot fix? So a hot fix is just like patches and stuff. That's what they, uh, they called it, a Broadcom called them, it was like hot fixes. So like they had like issues um, and they would send out like a quick patch to fix it. Um, so I had to apply all of those things. And uh, a lot of times you will run into a snag where it wasn't even letting you apply it. And uh, so you'll work with support, Broadcom support. And they were running into the same thing and they were like, man, I've never run into anything like this. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it's like you call Microsoft, you got something wrong with your computer and they're like, man, I don't know what's wrong with your computer. They the Microsoft specialist. So you and them are like in the background doing your little labs and doing your troubleshooting. And so you uh, can figure out what that issue is. So I said that was actually kind of fun. At first it was annoying when you're doing it by yourself. <laughs> 
it's kind of annoying. But uh, we kind of just like took some shots in the dark. Um, you know, we read the laws and tried to figure out what exactly the issue was. It's not always straightforward in those laws. I know people make it seem like it is, but it's really not. It's not straightforward at all. So it was definitely a learning experience that I will be taking with me uh, moving forward. Yeah, but the tech layoffs was tough, especially the way the market is now. How has the tech layoffs affected your family? Oh, it definitely affected it. Uh, you know, it affects, you know, um, how you can provide for them, which is to me the most important part. Uh, you know, I like to have my babies in all type of programs, uh, keeping them busy, putting them in tech programs themselves, whether it be like, you know, it could be other programs like swimming, it could be a tutor, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you can take them out more because you have way more uh, financial freedom. But when you work in a, you know, another role, you got to be a little more, you know, <laughs> uh, you got to manage your money more than you would when you was working in that tech space. Um, so I'll say, yeah, it definitely affected it majorly. You know, they was in gymnastics, swimming, uh, they was at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, they was always into something active. But, you know, we still try to keep them um, active as possible. Like, you know, they're in their little private school now that, that I pay tuition out of my <laughs> pocket. So tech or no tech, I still got to pay that check. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it, it definitely makes it so that you're more flexible and can, um, you know, provide for them the way you want to provide for them. How has this been for you mentally? Has it been taxing, frustrating? What words would you use to describe this this part of your journey? Um, it's definitely been mentally taxing because uh, you know, I kind of changed what my focus was as far as tech is concerned. You know, going from a monitor engineer to studying cloud architecture. Um, it's night and day, really. It's not the same at all. Um, then just kind of dealing with the market, dealing with how people operate. Like I had, uh, I had a, rec I had a recruiter reach out to me for an interview, and I interviewed with this guy who was like. Man, he was like in the tech industry for like 25 years. He was like military, you know what I'm saying? He was like a no BS guy. And I'm thinking like, man, this is about to be a hard interview. Get on the interview, he's like, all right, man, you know, tech guy to tech guy, we gonna talk high level, cloud architect, this, that, and the third. I'm panicking, I'm like, oh my God, dog. Like, <laughs> why did I get this guy, right? Well, he was, he was a cool guy, but um, we interview. I did pretty good on that interview, um, which was, you know, like I said, I was very nervous. Um, but then one of the recruiters contacted me later and was like, um, how, how many years of experience do you have doing a particular thing? Now, mind you, before they interview you, they kind of already go over your resume and your credentials. So I, I thought that was weird um, that they came back and, and try to, you know, ask me how much experience I had in a particular area. And I had about 10 years of experience. And they said, oh, well, um, we don't think you're gonna be a fit because we need somebody with 15 years of experience. All right, 15 years? It, it's almost like they want you to be, you know, in your 40s or your 50s for this position. I'm not that old, you know. 15 years ago, I was in high school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they wanted you to have 15 years and it, it becomes frustration, frustrating because then what you gotta do to get in the door, lie? It's almost like they want you to lie, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Tell them uh, what they want to hear. But they kind of had their mind up anyway. That's why they came with that. And it was after the interview, right? Uh, which, it was like, you wasted my time. I got I got other things that I could be doing. I could have been interviewing with somebody else, opposed to somebody who's going to waste my time. And you see a lot of that gatekeeping in the, in the tech field. You know, it's almost like they don't really care if you can do the job. It's like... They looking for something else. I'm not really sure what that something else is, but they definitely looking for something else. 
Um, and a lot of them look out for their own. So you could have uh, the experience, but if they got somebody else who just got out of school or certification class or something like that, they want to get them in, they will just have you interview just to say that they did the requirements and then hire the other person. So that part I really don't like. Please don't waste my time. Please. Babies came back to life. <laughs> As a single father, how has tech changed your life? Um uh man it kind of because of tech I, well I ain't gonna say because of tech I always had like high aspirations um I feel like that's one of the steps that I needed to kind of get where I want to be I'm still working towards that and it's just one of the steps it's not to me tech isn't the end all be all um but it's just like a means to an end um I like it. I've always been in tech. Like, even in um, high school, me and my friends used to, uh, we would go to a teacher's class so we can learn coding. Um, when I chose my electorates, I didn't even know that class was available until my friend made it aware to me. And we didn't necessarily have that class, but we would take time uh, during our break to go to her class so we can learn it. So it's always been something that I was interested in. Um, I used to like those, those uh, what's that movie back in the day, Hacker? <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, uh, I've always been interested in Hacker. Um, and when you got kids who game like you game, it's like, uh, it's like a gateway to tech, if you will. Because, um, you know, you're dealing with coding. Um, you're dealing with digital art. And it's all, like I said, it goes back to tech, so... Um, yeah, tech is pretty major in, in your life, man, at this point, you know, way, I think it's way bigger in our life, uh, than it was, you know, when I was a kid and you first got that first PC. Um, yeah, so it's all encompassing. Um, and like I said, it, it makes it so that I can do a lot for these babies, you know, cause it does get expensive. <laughs> it does. Man, they get expensive. Try to take them to the movies. That's a hundred dollar ticket. <laughs> that's that's a you want popcorn, you want uh slushies and all that. Yeah, it's not cheap. So you definitely need to br be bringing in some uh some good income. How dangerous is it to incorporate tech? into everyday items. For example, Internet of Things. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that, you know, that can be very dangerous. I mean, like, we talking. What's an example of an Internet of Thing item? <laughs> we talking like iRobot dangerous. <laughs> oh, well, Internet of Thing item could be uh, your, your, your Samsung refrigerator with the screen in it, right? Um, it could have a camera in it. The camera could be monitoring you, right? Um, there's always this duality, right? There's always like the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Remember, it's good and it's evil. And it all depends on how you use it. So, you know, a person can use, you know, AI for research purposes to find uh, a breakthrough for a cure. Or a person can use AI to find out poisonous combinations, uh, you know, so they can use it in a harmful manner. So there's always that danger, man, of like, you got to watch who this gets in the hands of. So, yeah, that can be very dangerous. I mean, your phone, your car, which I didn't even really think about it because I don't I don't have one of those cars now. But that's a real big thing with the electric cars. 
Um, you got Internet of Things in your car. <laughs> Right, and they and not only that, you got the automation where they can drive the car. That's why I said we talking about like our robot level types of danger. <laughs> and then you got uh, what the the Boston Dynamic robots. Now, now they haven't been made mainstream yet, but it's probably gonna come a day where uh, we can buy them and then you know use them for whatever purposes, taking the trash out or anything else. And if someone can hack those things and control them, it could definitely become dangerous. What is a DDoS attack? Uh, denial, if I'm not mistaken, it's denial of distribution of services, which... Distributed uh, denial of service. Yeah, distributed denial of service, which uh, pretty much going to sh shut your service down by uh, sending so much traffic that the service can't handle them and encumbering them. Which is, right now, so common kids can do it on games. You're talking about million dollar corporations that have dedicated servers <laughs> that are under a DDoS attack by 10 year olds. <laughs> and it's kind of insane when you think about it, man. So yeah, 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 tag, whew. It's definitely taking uh, a turn. I mean, some of the people you wouldn't even think would know anything about that, know how to do those attacks. What are the name of these sneakers? So these are Sias, um, six, seven, eights. Um, it's a guy out of California. He actually from New York. Um, the name of his brand is Sia Collective. These particular sneakers are very comfortable. I wear them every day and I beat them to, to oblivion. <laughs> I beat them to oblivion, but I pretty much, this is like all I wear at this point. You know, I got Jordans and everything. Them things have been retired. Um, this is like my favorite shoe. It's like one of the most uh, creative designers that's out there right now when it comes to shoes. And he actually got some, uh, you know, history in the shoe game. You know, I, you know, me also being deep in the music as being an artist. I, uh, I used to want those shoes that they had in the videos. And uh, in the videos, you'll see people wearing those uh, Air Force Ones with the, with the Gucci print, right? And I didn't know that he was a, so he was a customizer way back when, and he was the one making those shoes. So it's just kind of crazy how it came full circle. Like I was a kid looking at that and I used to go into certain stores looking for those shoes, but he was the one taking material and then um, sewing the material into those Air Force Ones and those shoes for some of the uh, most famous rappers at that time. And now he has his own brand where he makes his own stuff. How is rebranding yourself important? Oh man, you always gotta, you always gotta um, keep learning and keep growing. And who you was five years ago may not be who you are today. Um, so you definitely have to rebrand yourself so that you can keep growing. I mean, we was having that, I think we was having that conversation about uh, 2 chains at one point where, you know, he went from Titty Boy and, you know, it didn't really work for him. But when he when he changed the 2 chains, it took off. Um, a whole, and he also had to change his name because of the business contract. Yeah, because they own, own your name. It's a perpetuity. <laughs> Just like uh, Prince and became the symbol. Who's that, Ludacris? No, no, Prince. So Prince, no, Prince. No, no, no. I mean for two chains. Two chains. He was, so he was signed to DCP. Yes, correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's ludicrous. Uh, he was signed to them, and then when he left, he was uh, rebranded as Two Chains. You know. Then you got Prince. 
rebranded as the symbol. And then you got locks rebranded as LOX, right? You know, back in the day, I had no idea what that was about. Um, I didn't know they own your name. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I mean, those guys could have quit and said, you know what, if I don't got my name, I ain't got nothing, right? But they rebranded and they came back stronger. So yeah, it's super important. Looking good. You gonna clean the bottoms? Absolutely. Yeah, looking good, man. So where are you from originally? So I'm born in Washington, D.C. So I'm a native. Grew up South Carolina, Virginia, Louisiana. <laughs> Yeah, no, all my people from the South. Um, my mom, she was tasked with the, um, with the project of going down and taking care of my grandfather, my mom's uh, granddad. When he was sick, he had Alzheimer's. And so that's how I grew up in South Carolina because I left D.C., when I was about, I was in kindergarten when we left. So like when I was in first grade, that's when I went to South Carolina. Mm. And boy, was that an experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How would you say that time for you was important? Honestly, I feel like my time in South Carolina made me who I am. My belief system, my skill set, my callousness, how tough I am, the reason I don't quit, the reason I'm not afraid of nobody. You know, uh, down there I was kind of like a foreigner. Um, I used to get in the fights almost every day. Fight at the school, fight on the bus, fight when you get off the bus, um, a fight. <laughs> on the next block away from the bus stop and then a fight in front of your own house. Yeah, yeah, fight in front of your own house, you know. Fighting a guy, he show up, he got a baseball bat. Yeah, <laughs> he got a baseball bat and uh, he in front of my, he in my front yard. Well, he not in my front yard because we had a fence, but he's in front of the front yard right before you get into the yard, you know. Hit me with the bat, I grab it from him and we get to fight, right? Which is crazy. Because why you walk all the way to my house with a baseball bat? You don't even live around here. <laughs> you live like two blocks over, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they were kind of vicious, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but we fought so much that, you know, after a while you became friends. I'm talking about some of the guys who was known as like the biggest bullies down there, which was typically the guys who stayed back, right? And they'd pick on the, the new kids <laughs> and because they were stronger than everybody. Um... After y'all done fought a few times, you squash it, and man, the stuff you learn about people, man, like my mom used to always tell me, uh, you gotta be careful how you judge people, you never know what they're going through. And you know, as a kid, I really didn't wanna hear that because I'm fighting these people, right? Like I said, you got one guy showing up with a baseball bat, and these, they, you know, they kind of, they very violent. Um, but then one of the guys, man, I was chilling with one day, and I found out his mom was a, uh, she was a user, she was like a crack crackhead, right? And my mom, like, again, she used to always tell me, you never know what they got going on in their house, right? And then they bring that anger to school and then they take it out on you. Um, and if you overreact to it, then they become a victim of what you, you know, what you did. Um, so I just always try to be gentle with people because again, I never know what they got going on in their everyday life. Um, yeah. So I, I, I can say I had it better in that sense that he did. It was a reason he was staying back. His probably didn't have his uh, pops around. Mom was strung out on drugs and he frustrated in school. And you know, now he's the bully who stayed back two to three times and he don't really got no help. You know, so it could be a sad existence really. Uh, so yeah, man, everything like, <laughs> Put both shoes next to each other on the table. 
I want to see what the clean product looks like versus the we working on the product. Yeah, buddy. So the right one is the clean one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and the left one, you you working on it. <laughs> we about to get on it. I got you. Yeah. You could go ahead and uh, put that right that right one down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we came a long way, baby. <laughs> Yeah, that's also uh, living down there is where I kind of got my love for everything, man. My first, I say, my first love was writing. I used to write stories. Um, you know, it's kind of like why I'm a fan of like uh, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis. These are people who made uh, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Narnia. Um, I think at that time when I was down there, my favorite, my favorite book series was the uh, Animorphs. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The Animorphs was so cool because um, it was a story about these kids who had got this uh, this power from these aliens named the Andalites, um, who had crashed on Earth. They were being uh, chased by something called I think it was called the Yurks or something like that. They were like parasites. Right. And um, it gave the kids the power to transform into like different type of animals. Right. So the, the cool thing about the animals was at the bottom of the page, it was like a flip book. So it would show that that human transforming as that uh, into that animal as you flip the pages. So that was like one of the coolest things about that. That series, the story was phenomenal. Um, yeah, but that was like my first. Uh, my first love when I was a kid was writing. I always wanted to be a writer. Stories, movies, books, things like that. Then later I became an artist. That was the second. Uh, in the drawing and painting, animes and all of that stuff. And then music came later. And in the South, I say, man, we were super active. So like, my next door neighbor taught me how to do a backflip on his trampoline. And then the next day, we was attempting that backflip on the, on the ground, right? So gymnastics was my favorite sport. Um, and down there, you got a lot of land that's kind of like even <laughs> to where you can kind of go out, run, do your round off. And, and, Which and get, day was this? Uh, this is South Carolina, yeah. So yeah, you could, uh, that's kind of where I hone my, like I said, my skills, my personalities and everything I love, really. It all started there. And the roots of my family are there on my mom's side. Yeah, I went back a few years ago and the weather was perfect. Like, literally perfect. Like, no, no jacket, short sleeves, shirt, um, not too cold, not too hot, wind blowing, everything felt perfect. I forgot what it was like. <laughs> I forgot what it was like, man. It's one of those places where, like, if you retire, you need somewhere to move, that's one of the places you'll want to be. Yeah. Would you say you were taught what love is, or you had to figure out what love was as you grew up? Um... That's tricky as nuance, right? I know what I feel like motherly love is, um, or, you know, I guess love in general from your family, you know, from my dad, from my mom, they all exhibit it in a, in a different manner, in a different way. And then there's the love, you know, that you have for people that you're in a relationship with. And then there's that love that you have amongst your friends. Um, I feel like I learned it through experiences growing up. I don't know if you can really teach it. You know, you can tell people what stuff is, but if it don't resonate with it, with them, it's not going to, um, they're not going to really receive it. So yeah, I feel like I learned it through my experiences. Nobody really had it. Um, any conversations about what love was outright, you know? Um, it was just all about how you treat people and how you show, you know, your elders respect and 
how family is supposed to look out for one another. So I guess in a sense they was teaching it, but they wasn't telling you what it was. You know what I'm saying? They wasn't uh, identifying it as love. They was just telling you this is how we operate as a family unit. What's one piece of advice you'd give to someone who's never experienced real love before? Whew. Man, that's tough because uh, I met a few people who they were not as lucky as I was. I mean, their parents are, man. <laughs> I actually know a lot of people like that. Um, well, if if I knew them, the, the first thing I would tell them is you are love because, you know, I'm in your life. Um, and you just have to keep, you gotta keep pushing. You can't let nobody uh, crush your spirit. It's easier said than done. You can't let nobody crush your spirit. Um, and you deserve to be here. There's, then there's some explicit things we can say like, man, you know, F them peoples. <laughs> we ain't worried about them. <laughs> It's our life. We're not letting them dictate what we got going on. But again, easier said than done. Because, you know, people, they want to be loved by who they want to be loved by. Yeah. And unfortunately, things don't always work out that way for us. And sometimes it is for the better, man. You know, when you when you in it. Now, it's different when it's your parents. But when it's like an, um, a romantic relationship... You might think you want this person, but you let some time go by and it will be revealed to you why you guys could could never work. Yeah, and a lot of times, uh, some people may not experience that love because the people they have around them don't love themselves. So they take it out on you. Where does your love for tech come from? Uh, I love I love uh, just learning about how things work. And tech is, you know, tech is like the centerpiece of <laughs> society right now. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I remember I had toys that, uh, that were mechanical and I would take them apart and then put them back together again because I wanted to see First of all, I was bored. <laughs> That's what I want. But I wanted to see how this thing worked. How is this thing moving? Um, I think what they call it is reverse engineering. So typically, if somebody makes something, you take it apart to see how it works so you could kind of emulate it. Um, so I say start with that, man. Like, you, you want to know how a game works? You got to learn coding. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you got to learn, you know, algorithms and other things. Uh, back in the day, it was like C. You had to learn a C language because that's what most of the uh, game engines were based off of. It's different now. And it's probably a, a way easier to get in it. But yeah, just, just uh, always being inquisitive, curious, wanting to know how things work. What are the benefits of machine language models? And what are the dangers of large machine language models? Um, machine language models. Say what an example of it is. So are we referring to, because I want to make sure I understand what we 
referring to? Talk about Chat GPT. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so, so we're talking about. Um, I want to get the proper word for it. Uh, 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 I, th- I can't. It slips me what they call it, but it's like some type of engineer. I want to mm-hmm. say prompt engineer, something like that. Um, no, actually, I think you're talking about something different. Um, but yeah, machine language models. So you know how. Again, you get like I said, you got the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and I've seen people kind of debating this online, right? So you might ask ChatGPT a particular thing because you have to train it, right? It has to, it has to assess this information, and sometimes that information that it's being fed can be faulty information, erroneous information. Um, I would say that's the greatest danger because. <laughs> Oh man, I just got a good example. So a few years ago, when they first started doing these AI models, I believe it was Microsoft. They had asked it some questions and it was giving back problematic answers, like racist answers and kind of like, uh, like megalomaniac, like, uh, uh, manic type of answers talking about world domination, uh, culling the population, controlling the population. And it's like, where were you getting that from? Like, who was feeding you this information to the machine, right? <laughs> and I think they might have discontinued that pro- that uh, project at the time. They probably rebooted it up, but they had to fix that. So the machines, you know, it saw things the way a terrorist would see it. Um. So I think that was a flaw in whatever model they were using at that point in time. <laughs> and they had to go correct it. I think now what the concern is that I see people like Elon Musk uh, raising is that he feels like things are being overcorrected. I don't necessarily agree with that uh, conclusion. Um, I think it's pretty good where it is now. But depending on the model, I would say... Uh, just the inaccuracies, historical inaccuracies. Um, and the, it all, I think it would also depend on what they're using it for, right? So like, let's say somebody's in the medical field and they go ask ChatGPT something. And ChatGPT gets it wrong because you have some people in the medical field, they'll go pull up something on WebMD once they get your diagnosis and tell you, you know, here's what you need, and, you know, here's what you need to do. And in the near future, they probably won't be using WebMD just like I use Google a lot less and I'm using ChatGPT now, they might go to ChatGPT and ChatGPT might not have that information in their database, right? That might be very important. Um, so yeah, I think that's gonna be a challenge because uh, you wanna have so many people from so many different fields uh, looking towards AI for answers. And there's a saying where they say, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything that I know, right? And I think that right there is gonna be very important and very pertinent when we talking about people using AI to learn moving forward. Yeah, I might've taught AI uh, everything it know, but it doesn't know everything that I know, right? So there could be special circumstances where the information that I know that ChatGPT does not know is pertinent to what's going on. For now, AI can only live in the past. It can't really, it doesn't have access to the future. Yeah, um, I think, well, so I think they got certain uh, programs that they're training to kind of be able to think on their own. For now. Yeah, so like when you talk about quantum computing and some of the other stuff, Mm -hmm. I remember there was some talk about a specific program being able to solve a, unsolvable math problem yeah that right there that you know i'm (laughs) i'm not familiar with what they were referring to i did a little bit of digging into it but um that goes into quantum computing and that was i remember that was long before chat gpt even hit the scene see the issue with that though is this program finally being able to solve this one math problem that no one has solved doesn't mean it should be used to solve the other problems too because the math and how it got there aren't going to be the same for each problem or each approach 
Yeah. And when it comes to AI, what a lot of people don't think about is there's a reason you're supposed to be able to do things manually versus mm -hmm. automatic, like driving a car. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're very different. So yeah. as engineers and as architects, it's our responsibility to know, hey, if we didn't have access to this program or these answers, do you know how to get to that answer on your own? And if yeah. you don't, why are you not putting yourself in position to develop the muscle and the skill set to get there? Yeah, because another one of the dangers is mm -hmm. um, the, the playoff, what you're saying, um, it can handicap you. Yeah. Right? Like when I was younger, yeah, when I was younger, I remembered phone numbers. I still remember my grandfather's house number. It's still the same. Mm -hmm. Right? He probably had that number before I was even born. Yeah. But there's people that I meet and, you know, probably met two, three years ago, talk to them every day. I don't remember that phone number. If my phone, uh, <laughs> if I lost my phone, dog, I'll tell you, I don't remember your phone number. You know what I'm saying? And, and God forbid you change it one time. Yeah. Now I really don't remember what your phone number was. But granted, is, I remember because at that time it was necessary. Right? The only thing we probably had back then was like a roller decks and black books. You know what I'm saying? And after that, you just had to remember it. And you remembered it by heart because it was necessary. But now it's not necessary. So it kind of handicaps you. And it's going to be the same with, uh, with AI, man. You know, people are using it for coding. And... They're using it for <laughs> they're using it for a lot of things I'm not even aware of right now, and they're gonna start leaning on it too much to where they're probably gonna start forgetting, you know, their core values and the principles and the foundation of their trade or the mode of operation, like the correct steps to yeah. doing the thing correctly. Like what what steps does AI take away? Yeah, it's like fast food, right? I mean, you can go to and dine, you can go to a nice restaurant and dine in, but they're going to have to take time to prep it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a reward with that. But then there's like fast food. You know, there's pros and cons, right? You go to the fast food, you're not going to get something that uh, took time to be made properly. You're going to get something super quick, but it's going to be of low value. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think but people that's, may not be able to judge value anymore after that. Because they, once you grow yes. used to just accepting lesser or accepting something that's not convenient. as good, yeah, it's but convenient. the trade-off is faster. Faster, right? Yeah. So that's the value in it for them, faster. But how then, fast is too fast. But then how fast is dangerous too. Yeah. Because now you got, you got food that don't mold, <laughs> right? Now, you know what I'm saying? You got uh, food that's not healthy. Yeah. It's causing you all type of issues because you did it too fast. And you didn't think about the consequences of it. You probably overcooked it and dehydrated it. Now you're now in order for your body to digest it, you gotta pull the water from your body to uh digest the food. So when we strip, you know, when we strip the moisture out of foods in order for your body to digest it, it needs moisture. Yeah. Which is why they tell us to drink so much water. So I think that that thing with IT, like it's a phenomenal tool, but if you lean on it too much, it can cripple you. Yeah. And it could be a security risk. How so? So that's one of the things that, um, in IT right now that people are trying to balance is uh, it, has, it has access to a ton of information, right? So if you're a coder, because they typically don't want you to use that for coding. Um, somebody could put something in, you know, the IT, not the IT, the... Uh, AI program where they can look to see if anybody's putting any type of code into the prompt to do coding for them. And you know, in that code, you got all type of pertinent information, right? You got uh, the environment that it might be set up in, the location it might be set up in, the company it might be for, the type of program that it is. You got a lot of information in there. Your keys and stuff might be um, safe. But they can deduce, like, who's using it. If, like, again, if the wrong person hack it, like, let's say it's like Facebook, right? The wrong person hack it, and they can watch your keystrokes and what you're doing in it. They can pull that information, right? And if they can get that code, they can change the whole application uh, <laughs> to their will. So, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, there's always a danger with stuff like that. 
It's, it's front facing. And uh you have to define what front facing is. Uh customer. So you know, you got people who work in the back end and people who work on the front end. And the front end is going to be what the customers are dealing with. The layman and the clients and the customers. And what they have access to. Yeah, so they're going to... Have, but they're only going to have access to certain information. So typically, only the people on the back end would have information to things like that code and that script, right? But if you put it into something like ChatGPT and it becomes compromised... You know, now somebody on the front end has access to it. Now, you, now, now you're open to all type of vulnerabilities. Yeah. And I'm sure there's way more things I haven't even thought about yet with it. But yeah, that's one of the challenges, I would say. It's an exciting tool, though. Very exciting. And one thing I do like about it is... You can kind of talk to it, right? And you can kind of teach it and correct it. So like if you, if you inquire something of it and it doesn't give you the answer that you're looking for, you can, you can reference a source and say, well, I found this and here's the source that corroborates it and then ask them to update the answer that they gave you and then ask them like a new question and it, it will like correct itself right it'll look at the inf it'll actually read the information and say yes based on this information this is a possibility and it actually correct itself so i do like that um seems uh, a little less stubborn than most humans are right <laughs> you get some information a uh, human's not familiar with and you give it to them they're like well i don't care if you got a source for it i still don't believe it you know what I'm saying? but chat gpt will actually take it into account based on that source. So I think that's a positive for sure. Now that you've cleaned your everyday shoe, mm -hmm. what makes this an everyday shoe? Oh man, this particular shoe, like I said, it's just so comfortable. Um, I can stand on my feet for hours and not feel any pain. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's it for me. You get some other shoes, man, you might get three, four hours in them and then all of a sudden the bottom of your soles are aching. Yeah. This particular one, no. This this one, man. He did a great job on this one. Great job. How would you say you treat yourself in comparison to your everyday shoe? Uh I probably treat myself just like this every day, shit, man. I ain't gonna lie, you know me, man. I'm not a very vain person. Um, I've never been that. Uh, if I got a special event or something coming up, I might get my hair done. But outside of that, man, I might walk outside, hair looking crazy. Don't, don't really care. Uh, what's important for me are like the important things. So it's not necessarily about what things look like. Um, it's about you know, what's important to me. So I would say like, I'm always studying it, whether that be history, whether that be tech, whether that be music. Um, the one thing that comes to my mind is, uh, I remember when Kendrick Lamar was doing the interview and they were asking him about his hair and it was like, dog, why your hair so crazy? Why, you know, you just, you're doing the interview and, and you came up here looking crazy. And he laughed at him and was like, dog, when I'm in creative mode, I'm not thinking about being cute. You know, me as a creator, I'm like that. Like, I'm, I wake up in that mode, I go to sleep in that mode, and I barely sleep. I'm always creating. So everything else feels like it takes time away from that, right? Like, you might be working on something, and it's like you keep pounding, you keep pounding the concrete until you can get to this breakthrough. But if you take this break to go play in your hair and be in the mirror and you try to be cute, I'm actually wasting time or taking time away from that breakthrough that I'm, you know, working towards. So, um, yeah, I so said that's how it plays so for me. Yes, sir. Get the bottoms, and these are good. 
coming out of the tech layoffs, what have you learned about yourself? Let's say the top two things you've learned about yourself. <laughs> I'm stubborn. <laughs> I'm stubborn, man. I really don't like to deal with what I feel like is going on in the tech world right now. This feels like a lot of politics that I want no parts of. But also, I'm not a quitter. Right? Um, when you invest a lot of time into something, it's like I'm not just about to, you know, move on to something else. I put too much time in this, it gotta pay off. Um, so I just say, yeah, it kind of just reaffirmed what I already knew about myself. Um, even my grandma was saying that. She said, one thing about you, you're like a pit bull, man. Once you lock into something, you don't let it go. <laughs> Once you determine this, what you want to do, and you lock into it, you don't let it go. What's one other thing you've discovered about yourself in this layoff? Um, resilient. Resilient. Uh, I mean, it's similar similar thing but man this this thing really has like a uh it really takes a mental toll on you um especially when you got people dependent on you and it's like you you kind of want to shift and go on to something else it's like man i got like i said i got people you know who can't wait we gotta get things done now um and you do those things why you know you do those things for a time, but you keep pushing in a particular direction until you can get to your destination. Um, and it's not always easy. It's, it's not easy at all. It's, it's really a terrible space to be in mentally. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, you definitely need like some mental acuity. You need to be super sharp. You need to be shrewd. Um, you're dealing with very intelligent people in the, in the tech industry and some of them are very conniving <laughs> you know you get on those interviews they definitely trying to uh trap you sometimes um you got to know how to traverse those environments when you're dealing with those type of people i will also say it kind of made me um you know, it kind of made me aware or remember where exactly I wanted to be. Right, I never, I never really wanted to be the person who worked for other people all my life. Because see, these people, they, they run their business a certain way. And typically we don't agree with how they run their businesses a lot of the time. And so you do want to get to a point to where you can be in the, uh, the position of power and run your company or what you perceive as the right way. So I think that's super important. Not just to be content to just be working for somebody and receiving a check, but I would rather, because I know what it feels like for me to be in this position. Um, I got other people who have been less fortunate in worse positions, and I would like to be in a position to actually be able to help them and reach back and pull them up when I get there. You know. So I think that's really important for us. It's bigger than me. After sitting through years of interviews and seeing the goalposts move so many times, how has your mindset changed when it comes to applying to jobs? Um, and figuring out what being the right fit looks like for you on the tech side. So I say in the beginning, I probably was like more flexible with kind of always wanting to meet whatever their criteria was, which really wasn't realistic. In tech, you're not going to know everything, but it did feel like these people wanted you to know everything. Um, I think you got to know what your specialty is and you just got to stick to it, right? Because I did, I, I think I did uh, make a mistake of trying to cater to a particular role um, that I might have been less qualified for um, or could have specified in a certain thing I didn't have uh, all the necessary skills for. But on particular interviews where it was things that I was uh, more comfortable with and familiar, those went far more smoother, you know? So I would say 
stick to your guns. Uh, stick to what you know. Stick to what you know. You have better outcome. Because they, <laughs> in this in this field, man, they, they definitely could, uh, you know, put some things on those job descriptions that have absolutely nothing to do with, you know, the role that they're telling you you're applying for, right? Um, I remember I went for one role and well, it was like a panel interview, maybe four or five people. And boy, they had people from all different departments asking me about stuff that ain't had nothing to do with my job. <laughs> it's like they wanted me to know this guy over here, he wanted to know if I can do his job. This guy over here wanted to know if I can do his job. And the other person, it was like three, four people wanted me to know, wanted to know if they could, if I could do their job. Right? Which told tells me they were about to go do something else. And I was about to be stuck with three, four roles, right? And undercompensated. Let's keep that in mind because if they're doing three different jobs, right, and they want to turn these jobs over to you and make sure you can do them all, they're paying you under the, uh, they're paying you below whatever the market rate is. And on top of that, each one of their jobs commands a different salary. And they're not giving you that, you know, combined salary to do all three of those jobs. They're not even giving you two of the salaries, right? <laughs> so when you look at that, man, you got to, you know, they, they will play in your face. Right. And you can't let them do that because this is business out there. You can't let them do that. They need you. These companies need you to run. And if they don't have you, you see what happened, man. All these data breaches is going on. If I was on their team, this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> yeah. They hiring people who don't have the expertise. They hiring their friends. You know what I'm saying? And guys who have the qualifications, you know, they still applying. But then what happens? Oh, well, you know, data breaches. Everybody vulnerable now. Yeah, that's, that's the type of culture that it seems like is going on right now. And I also think, like, when it comes to jobs, man, some of these jobs, they're not as hard as people try to make them out to be. Um, you know, back in the day, you used to have trade schools in school, and then you used to have training when you got hired. It may take you a month to really learn that role. Um, and sometimes I feel like they don't really want to hire. Like, they want to get the money and then act like <laughs> they out to hire, but they don't really want to hire. Because these jobs aren't rocket science. Last question. Yes, sir. How important is it to surround yourself with the right people when it comes to not only being in the tech industry, but growing in the tech industry? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's important for tech and just life in general. Because, uh, you know, still sharp and still. Right, so when you, you got other people who are also in tech and you guys can have those conversations and bounce those ideas off of one another and talk about what you read today and what they discovered today, um, that helps. Uh, especially when you're doing research. One person might be researching a specific topic in a specific field. You might be researching an, another topic and when you guys talk together, something that you never even thought of, you, you just learn it in probably under two minutes, right? Without having to go through the sources, without having to do the lab and without having to, you know, so you learn quicker, you grow quicker, you know what I'm saying? So it's definitely important to have a knowledgeable community of people around you for anything that you're trying to do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I learned so much from people. Simple conversation. Hey, man, did you hear about this happening today? I mean, you had you, <laughs> you specifically uh, had those conversations all the time, man. Did you hear about the data breach, man? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Right. Um, things you was unaware of now being brought to your attention, and now you're more knowledgeable about a situation you didn't even know existed. You know what I'm saying? So I'll say that's super important, right? Um, they might run across some information you didn't run across. Uh, you might be 
you might be studying more of the security side of cloud architect. They might be studying the database side, right? And you might say, man, I don't really get that database part. And they can break it down to you in layman's terms, you know what I'm saying? In five minutes, and now you understand it. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with security. So, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah super important. <laughs> super important, man, because some people, what I found is sometimes when you're trying to look into a subject you're not really familiar with, the person who's writing that article or that course is very long-winded, right? And it might take them very long to get to the point, right? Just tell us how this is done, right? We don't want to, like, you know, drag this thing along. Or if you're going to be long-winded, at least justify the long-windedness. Here's the point, but these four topics relate to this one topic we're building up to and it's very important that if i give you the solution for this you have to either have a background or understand how these four components work yep. before we get to the solution yeah um so you, again so you can get that from your circle of knowledgeable it practitioners or you can get that also from ai right I think that's one of the benefits, man. Like I found myself asking, you know, you'll run into a hiccup and you might ask Google something to try to find it, uh, some information and it'll take you to a forum and you got people asking the same question and running into the same uh, issue. They may be able to solve it. They may not be, but you got to read through it. You got to read through the responses. Oh, did you do this? And oh, did you do that? So you can kind of get a, a gist of what the thought process is on how to troubleshoot certain things. So that's the good thing about it. But sometimes they never come to a conclusion on how to fix it, right? Um, then you, or you might get in one of those and they may never answer the question at all, even attempt to. You, you get an article, the article is about a particular subject, and then they just kind of talk in a roundabout manner and beat around the bush and don't never get to it. But then you hit up AI, chat GBT, and that thing, do, 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 line for line. Instantly, it's like, yeah, this is the new search engine for me. <laughs> this is the new search engine for me. And if you got friends, you know, who, uh, you know, they got certain experiences that you can go to and they can kind of tell you, hey, man, this is how I did it when I ran into that. Right. So that's really important to have to be able to pull from. I think something really important that uh, a lot of this new AI and tech that has the answers just done as force the people who said, hey, you need to keep that close to the vest. And they put all the answers out there. Now folks are like, okay, now that these answers are out here, who are you without having the answers mm, yeah. over people's heads? Can you still work with people? Mm. Can you still bring value to your team? Do you care about your team? Are you gonna be a lone wolf when it comes to the IT side of things? And also, has keeping those secrets made you want to grow less on the IT side of things instead of working more? I think it's really important for us to understand that we don't need to be good at every job, but the job that you do apply to or the job that you already have a passion for that you're studying for or working on that you thoroughly understand, all right, if I'm this thing, what does it mean to become that thing? And am I actually putting in the proper work, surrounding myself with the proper people yeah. and creating the right opportunities for the right people to come across my talents? And not a company that's gonna want me to be 12 other talents that's not this main talent. Yeah. And then, all right, if that's not the case, how willing am I to actually adapt and what does adapting look like? Like, can you adapt while maintaining your core? Yeah, adaptation is very important. Um, and you need people who won't push you, right? Because sometimes you want to quit. <laughs> God yeah. knows. God knows sometimes you want to quit, man. You need some people to remind you who you are. You need the right call out. Absolutely. Yeah. You need reinforcements. Super important. Yeah, these babies look, you know what I'm saying, a thousand times better. <laughs> and Cloud Architect, and this is a day in my shoes.